When the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross that day 2,000 years ago, I want to tell you something. The veil of the temple did go down. And because it went down, the praise can go up. This morning, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, as we dig into the sixth word that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks from the cross. It's a word that is a word of victory. It's a word that is a word of conquering. It's a word that's a word of, uh, 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 of being the winner. Jesus Christ speaks his word of victory, and it's a powerful word that he speaks, and it's the word of finish. He speaks out, he cries out, it is finished. You know, many things in life never get finished. The yard work never gets finished. The cooking never gets finished. You know, the... Whatever it is, it never gets finished. College never gets finished. Nothing gets finished. But Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, and the last words that he speaks, he speaks this word of victory. It's a word of finish. He says, Tetelestai, it is finished. Now understand, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is ex he's completely exhausted at this point. He's completely worn out. But I want to tell you something. He is not defeated. He is not defeated. And he doesn't whimper out and it is finished. The last three words that Jesus speaks is, is I thirst and it is finished. And Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And in John 19, verses 28 through 30, this is what we read. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. And he said that for several reasons. We looked at last week. And one of the reasons for that thirst was to, to moisten his lips. One of the reasons was to, to, to give him the, the, the fortitude to, to proclaim these next two words. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they, they put a sponge in it, uh, um, upon a branch of hyssop, and brought it up to his mouth. And therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. And understand, Jesus doesn't speak this word in, in defeat, but he acclaims it in victory. He doesn't say, oh, woe is me, I am finished. But he proclaims and acclaims, it is finished. To the religious leaders and to the Roman soldiers and to those looking on that day, it certainly appeared that he was finished. To the disciples, their, their dreams of the kingdom were finished. And even Satan looked at that cross in glee and he said, the Son of God is finished. But what is it that Jesus meant here? He didn't say, I am finished, but he said, it is finished. Certainly he was talking about perhaps his humiliation and his sacrifice and his pain and his grief, but there's a lot more to it. The word here in Greek is the word tetelesi. And, and if we study that word, it's like a diamond that is looked at from different perspectives, gives you a different ray, it gives you a different picture, so to speak. It was a term that were used of, of those who were painters of, of uh, great things, you know, that you know, are painting a picture on a canvas. I remember when my father-in-law retired a number of years ago, you know, he had been a builder all of his life, and he said, in my retirement, I'm going to take up painting, art. I'm thinking, what's that all about, you know? 
I mean, I, I just didn't picture him doing that. But he did. And, you know, I mean, I remember the first few paintings kind of came out. I, you know, okay. And then he got better and better. And finally, a number of years ago, when I only had three kids, he painted a portrait of the three kids. And, you know, it was this big project. And, and when he brought it down here and presented it to us, he said, it's finished. And then when our fourth child, that little surprise, came along a number of years later, you know, he did another, another portrait of her, but he said, well, wait a minute, this one's not finished. I'm thinking, well, okay, what's well, got to be? But he had to do some finish-up work on it another time when he came, and then he said, it's finished. And this is what the artist would do. He'd say, tetelestai, it is finished, when that, when that painting was done. Or sometimes it was used in the relationship of a servant. And, and, and the master had given the servant a job to do, and, and the servant had completed it. And when that job was completed, the, the servant would go to his master and say, Tetelestai, it is finished. And when Jesus declares, Tetelestai, here's what he's saying. He's saying, first of all, the fulfilling of Scripture is accomplished. It's been done. As I've shared with you, there are more than 380 direct prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that God gave in the Old Testament over thousands of years to a multitude of authors. And he said this, he said, the real Messiah, because, you know, you've got to understand what was going on in that day. Jesus wasn't the first one that claimed to be Messiah. But when the real Messiah comes along, this is what God said, the real Messiah will fulfill every, every one of those prophecies to the stroking of a T, and to the dotting of an I. And as you study the Lord Jesus Christ, you find out that he fulfilled every single one of them. And not only were the prophecies fulfilled, uh, but as promised, they became a reality. And so God promises to send a Messiah, and he promises that he will die for our sins, that Jesus is the spotless Lamb of God. And when he had finished his suffering on the cross, the picture was finished, tetelestii. In the Old Testament, God gave us partial pictures of Jesus, glimpses of what God had planned to do. I mean, if you were reading, you know, and you were in the time of, of, of the writing of Genesis during Moses' day, and you read about the time when God said to the serpent, you're going to be cursed, you're going to crawl on the ground, and you're going to bruise the heel of the one I'm sending, but he will crush your head, you might not fully get it. And when you read about Abraham offering his son Isaac on the altar of sacrifice and God providing another sacrifice in the bushes, you might not fully get it that God is going to bring about a sacrifice. And when you hear God say that the life is in the blood, you might not fully get it about this sacrifice's blood that's going to be poured out for, for the offering of mankind. You might read through the, 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 the tabernacle, about the tabernacle and the wilderness wanderings and the deliverance from Egypt and about the Passover and and not fully get it. But in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 47, Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them what was written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And the entirety then of the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, everything in the Old Testament is really talking about the one and only coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Whether you're reading about Moses or whether you're reading about uh, Jonathan or whether you're reading about David or reading through Jeremiah, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Its entirety is about Christ. The laws of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Joel and, and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum and all these people and all these Psalms, it's all about Jesus. Because in the Old Testament economy, it was never finished. Man, God would work on them, and they'd get good for a while, and, and, and they'd get blessed, and then they'd slip away for a while. It was never, ever, ever finished. But God in Jesus Christ, as the fulfillment of Scripture says, it is finished. 
In Luke chapter 24, he says he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And that's so important. They didn't fully understand. As a matter of fact, that's a good principle for us to walk by today. Sometimes when we read and we don't understand, we simply say, God, I don't understand. I'm a dummy. How many of you can do that? Let's try that. Repeat after me. Father, I don't understand. I'm sitting next to a dummy. (laughs) No, really, I am a dummy. You know, because sometimes we just don't get it. And so we, we ask the Lord, Lord, open my mind. Open my heart. You know, give me a spirit of understanding. Help me to understand what you're speaking. And he told him that it was written that he must suffer and he must die, but he's going to rise again. He's going to be victorious. And so Jesus opened their minds to the Scripture. He, he opened their minds to all that, that God had for them. He was the fulfillment of Scripture. But not only was he the fulfillment of Scripture, not only did he do that, tetelestai is finished, because everything you need to know about God is in Christ Jesus. He's the full and final revelation of God the Father. You know, people always want to run around and read this book or read that book or go to this conference or go to this meeting. Listen, if you want to get to know the Father intimately, there's not a preacher in the world that's going to bring you to that. There's not a concert in the world that's going to bring you to that. But His Word will. Because you get to know Him. His Spirit speaks within you. You get to know Jesus better than you've ever known Jesus. And you get to know the love of God the Father more than you've ever known. But he's a fulfillment of Scripture, but he's also a fulfillment of the law. Because think about this. You know, God gave us this great big law in the Old Testament. It's called the Ten Commandments. You know, it's the the big ten. Thou shalt not covet. All these kind of things. And and, and when he tells us that he's a fulfillment of the law, tetelestiae, it's also used then in a judicial term. It's used in the courts, referring to a sentence and to the completion of that sentence. So when Jesus says, Tetelestiae, he says, it is the fulfillment of law. The sentence of the law is death on the cross, and it's been paid, and it's complete. I have finished the work. In Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, the Bible says, For what the law was powerless. In other words, Nobody's ever been saved by keeping the law. What it was powerless to do in that it was weakened by our sinful nature because, you see, it was powerless, our weakened sinful nature. You know, we choose to do these things. God did by sending his own son, the likeness of sinful man, to be a sin offering. And he condemned sin in uh, in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. In other words... There's an exchange process that goes on right here. But before there could be an exchange, there had to be a perfect sacrifice. And you know, the only person in all the world to have never uh, sinned and to keep every law as according to the Bible is Jesus Christ. I mean, none of us have ever, have ever, you know, done everything we're supposed to and kept the law. I mean, like this, we're all liars. I mean, you've ever lied about anything? Raise your hand. Come on, get them up, because, I mean, you're just going to sit there and really point out that you're a liar if you don't get your hand up, because we all lie. Or, or you know, we might be a thief. You know, uh, we, we have these different things. You know, we lie, we tell these big sta- tales, or, or sometimes we're just a thief. You know, I remember when I was a kid, man, I'd gone to downtown Gainesville, Georgia with my mother and my sister and led, let me loose in Woolworth in the toy department downstairs. You know, it was in the basement of the building. And I just filled my pockets full of uh, little, um, little cars because I didn't have them all packaged up and tied down where it takes, you know, uh, an engineering degree, Chris, to, to figure out how to open these things, you know. Man, my pockets were stuffed. We got home, and I got down on the floor in the, in the den, and it was the hardwood floors. My mother had hardwood floors. I remember growing up that we had to get down on our hands and knees with Johnson paste wax. Any of y'all identify with this? And rub that paste wax in and then come back and buff it off. I praise God for the day she got carpet. But, you know, my sister comes in the room, where'd you get those? Man, don't you know she was full of glee to tell my mother? And I remember being driven back downtown and taken into the store and having to empty out my stuff to that store manager. And he said, you know, this time I won't put you in jail, but next time I will. That cured my thieving ways. 
But you know, we've all been guilty of stuff, have we not? None of us have kept it perfectly. We've all been guilty of sin. You know, sin has, has overtaken us. And, and, and so, you know, the law did what it did for me and what it does for you. It condemns us. And we think, well, man, you know, I, I can't even tell the truth, much less can I always honor God. Might as well just go out and party like a heathen. And so it condemned us. And it showed us how much we didn't measure up. And it showed us how imperfect we were. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ came along and he kept it perfectly. And then he satisfied that law by paying for our sins. He was a spotless lamb of God upon the cross. None of us, no matter how willing we might have been, would have been an appropriate sacrifice because we're messed up. But he's the only one that's not messed up. And so Paul writes to the Colossians. Now understand who Paul is. Before his conversion, his name was Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. I mean, he was an uptight religious dude. He understood it. He was as to the he was a, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, man. I mean, that's like saying, you know, I'm a Christian of Christians. I carried the biggest Bible in the church. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm circumcised on the eighth day. And this is what Paul wrote. He said that he canceled the written code. He, he canceled out that debt with his regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. That's what the law has done. And he took it away. And what did he do with it? He nailed it to the tree and he covered that law with his blood and with his sacrifice and he took it away so that he paid that penalty he was the fulfillment of the law's requirement wouldn't it be great tomorrow in the mail if you got a letter from american express or visa or mastercard or even your mortgage company your account is paid in full amen y'all aren't very excited are you I, I think that deserves an amen. amen. You know, that would fire you up. You know, your mortgage is paid, your, your credit cards are paid, and all that kind of stuff. And that's what Jesus did when he went to the cross and he bled there on that cross. He said, for those of us who acknowledge and come to him, that the debt is paid in full. In Romans 10, 4, it says, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. What does it mean to believe? I look to him. I see him on the cross. I don't look at him like the religious leaders did. I don't look at him like the Roman soldiers did. I don't look to him like the others standing around that day did. But I look to him as the, son, as, as the father did upon his son, the perfect sacrifice for my sin, who takes it away that I in him might have life. I look at him not in a, in a borrowed tomb, but I look at him as the victorious and risen Lord, the Son of God, who said one day as he ascended into the sky that this same Jesus, not, a, not an apparition and, and not a hologram and not a ghost, but this same Jesus who went up is going to come back again one day. And he's coming to get me. He fulfilled it. He met the demand. He fulfilled as well the sacrifice because there's not a perfect sacrifice found except in him because tetelestia was used in reference to that sacrificial system. And when the priests offered the sacrifice, it was symbolic of Jesus coming. And the sacrifice the priests offered was a spotless lamb, an unblemished lamb. And when he did it, he'd say tetelestia, but it was only finished for a short time. It was only finished for another year. But when Jesus Christ came, he was the perfect sacrifice for all time. Tetelestai also means that the, it fulfills sin's penalty. He fulfilled the scripture, and he fulfilled the law, and he fulfilled the sacrifice, and he paid my penalty. He paid the penalty for my lie and thieving ways. He paid the penalty for all the things that I have done wrong. Colossians 1.14 says, The Son paid for our sins, and in Him we have forgiveness. And you know, oftentimes as we purchase things, we tend to use credit cards. 
And if you don't pay them off every month, you know what happens? That interest starts piling up, and you pay, and you pay, and you pay. Or like your mortgage, you know, you, you've got this great deal on a house. Do you go to sign those mortgage documents, and you see for that $50,000 house you bought, you're going to pay $5 million by the end of the 30 years. I've exaggerated it. I don't know where you can find a $50,000 house, and I hope you don't pay $50 million or $5 million or whatever else it may be. I just exaggerated that. But it does not exaggerate sin's penalty upon us. It piles up on us, and it piles up on us. But Jesus, when he declares tetelestia, he said, I've paid that in full. In Hebrews 7, 27, the Bible says, he's not like the other priest who had to offer sacrifices every day, first for their own sins. Did you know the priest sinned? Did you know your pastor sins? Yeah, I know you're shocked. I am. I mean, sometimes I look at, how could I do that? But we sin. And then for the sins of the people, Christ offered his sacrifice only once. And the Bible says, and for all time when he offered himself. That means that when Jesus Christ came to earth and bled and died on the cross, it was once and for all, never to happen again. When Jesus came the first time and rode into Jerusalem, he was on a donkey. But when he comes again, he'll be on a great white horse. When he went into Jerusalem the very first time, he was the Messiah who was beaten and battered and bruised. But when he comes back, he's going to be the majestic king. He's going to be the, uh, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the bride and the morning star, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Because he did it once and for all. In Hebrews 10, 18, the Bible says, And when sins have been forgiven, there's no need for other sacrifices. That means all the sins in my life and all the sins in your life, Jesus will take care of the bill. You know what that means? You know, through the years, sometimes on Sunday, I've been out at a restaurant with my family and, and dining. And I ask the, the waiter, you know, for, for, my, for my bill. And they say, well, sir, somebody took care of it. Isn't that an awesome thing to happen? Y'all don't know much about blessing. You know, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I mean, isn't it kind of a blessing when that happens? It's glorious. And maybe you ought to go bless somebody at lunch today. Or get blessed. Who knows? You know, it goes around. But here's the deal. Once that bill's been paid, I don't have to pay it again, right? Is that the way it works? I mean... I go over here to Longhorn and have lunch today and, and say, Devin's there. He's the drummer. And Dave, Devin looks over there and sees Pastor. Man, Pastor's got the biggest steak Longhorn bakes or grills. And a chocolate stampede for dessert. You ever seen one of those things? Man, those things are huge. You know, just all the stuff to make you blow up or something. He says, I know Pastor's going to blow up, but I'm going to bless him before he does. And... He takes care of it. Okay, now here's the deal. Do I have to pay for that again? Because it's paid for. So Jesus paid for my sins. And you know, here's the deal sometimes that we get into in our lives. We think, man, if I serve God a little bit more, he's going to like me more. If I, if I go to church more, he's going to like me more. If I witness more, he's going to like me more. It's nothing about God liking you more. He couldn't like you any more than what he did in sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to live, to die, to be buried, and rise for you. He loves you that much. <clears throat> Isaiah wrote these words, but now, thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you and I have called you by name. You are mine. You're mine. When God says you're his, there's nobody else is going to be able to touch you. There's nobody else going to be able to mess with you. And when Jesus said, Tetelestai, it is finished, those words are the most important words that have ever been spoken down through the ages of mankind. For he was declaring that it's finished. And if it's not finished, we're in deep trouble. If it's not finished, we're hopeless. If it's not finished, we're doomed. Because we can't do it ourselves. Jesus is the one who fulfilled the scriptures. 
and fulfilled sin's penalty. And finally, he's the fulfillment of victory. Jesus broke the power of sin and death. He broke that grip, the grip of death, the grip of sin, when he declared it is finished, giving it a shout of victory. In Romans 5, 17, the Bible says, For by transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through that one, Jesus Christ. In other words, death reigned through the one. You know, we're all the seed of Adam. Adam's our father, every single one of us. He's the first man God created, and then the earth got populated. He said, go out and be fruitful and multiply. And there's been a lot of multiplying going on. And so sin comes to us naturally. By, by, by nature, I am a sinner. I'm born in sin. But also, I'm a sinner by choice. Am I not? I mean, sometimes I choose to do that which I ought not to do. Like, how many of you are on vacation today? Congratulations, you came to church on vacation. Now, how many of you vacationers drove here? How many of you sped? That is, you went above the speed limit at any point along the way. <laughs> See there? Now, if a police officer pulls you over, and you say, well, I can't help it because I'm a sinner by nature, and my nature made me do it. Um, Joe Preston's a sheriff's officer here. Joe, would that cut them loose? Not. They chose to do it. How many of you got a ticket on the way? You know, brother, I feel for you. There's a guy in the last service. You're not a pastor, are you? Are you a pastor? God bless you. See, I told you, your pastor sins. <laughs> How many pastors we got here this morning? We usually have, all right, a couple? Amen. I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you're getting blessed today. You know, but we're, we're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. But Jesus, when he went to that cross, he made us righteous as we place our hope, as we place our trust in him. And Romans 6.10 says, For death, that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. That means that when Jesus gets into my life, although I'm a sinner by nature and a sinner by choice, he gives me the power to overcome it. It doesn't mean I'll never sin again, but it means that he's given me the power to overcome my habits and my hurts and, and my hang-ups. You know, we studied about those three things in Life's Healing Choices a while back. You know, we, we all have habits. I mean, you know, if you don't think you're a habitual creature, just think about what you do every day, about the moves that you make, the way you go, the things you do, different things. I mean, we're creatures by habit. And we all have hurts there, you know. We try to cover up and bury and, and do all that kind of stuff. And, and we've all got these kinds of hang-ups in our life, you know. And we, we think everybody else is weird, and we're the ones that are a little weird, you know. But Jesus came to forgive us. And he came to give us a supernatural ability that we could be more than conquerors in this world. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And only in this way could he set free all those who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of are you afraid to die? You know, I was saved when I was eight years old. But in my late teens, mid to late teens, you know, I really got away from God, and I didn't walk with God very closely until he got a hold of me. And I was about 22 years old. And sometimes I'd lie down at night, and I would think to myself, if, now if I were to die, and I hadn't been very good, would I go to heaven? At 22, when the Lord really got a hold of my heart and my life and really shook me up and brought me to a place of bowing before his throne to walk before him in faithfulness, he took all that away. I'm not afraid to die today. I don't want to die today, but I'm not afraid to die today. I don't know why I don't want to die today. I mean, to live is Christ, but to, to, to die is gain. <laughs> 
But you know, you don't have to be afraid of that. And you realize that you're never really ready to live until you're ready to die. And here's what the Lord calls us to. He calls us to die to ourselves, To die to all these old things within us. Well, man, if I become a follower of Jesus, I'm not going to have any fun. Listen, I have some great fun. And I provide other people with great fun. I mean, we were breaking a fast in Morocco one time <laughs> with some Muslims. I was so tired. I remember sitting down on the floor, and I don't remember anything else. I passed out. That's pretty funny, isn't it? I mean, you know, everybody on the team was giving me a hard time. Pastor, you went to sleep in the, in the meal that broke the fast that night, and we were an honored guests. Sorry. In Papua New Guinea a number of years ago, they came in and made this presentation. Now, get it. I mean, it's hot there. It's like 150 degrees 24-7. And we were worn out. We'd been building a house for the missionaries there in the midst of the jungle. And I remember... Here's my excuse. One of our team members kept getting up during the night, and I'd hear this person go up the stairs into the house. I was sleeping in the tent underneath the house, right? And they'd open the door, the screen door very, very quietly so as not to disturb me. And I'd hear it go, <coughs> Lee Forrester, where'd you go? I saw you up. You remember this, don't you? And, and then this person would sit down at the keyboard on that computer, and I listened to this. Tick, 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 tick. I was ready to pinch your head off. But anyway, that night, the missionary is showing us something in the house, and I'm laid back. I gave entertainment again. I snored during the presentation. <laughs> so you can have fun as a Christian and provide fun as a Christian. No doubt about it. Being ready to die to our old self means that I die to these old lustful things inside that, that tear me up and tear me apart and tear me down. Because listen, God doesn't want you to be defeated. Just like Jesus is not defeated on the cross, he's the forerunner for us. He wants you to live in victory. He wants you to live in abundance. He wants you to live in power. He wants you to walk before him in all your ways. But it comes when I say no to myself, to the things that tear me down, and I say yes to Jesus. That's what real life's all about. And when we're ready to die, then we're ready to live. Are you ready this morning? Would you give God your heart, your life? Would you really say to him, Lord, have your way in me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you've given to us. And Lord, we pray that in these moments in which we're given to respond, that we'd say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your ways. In Jesus we pray, amen. Let's stand together. Would you come right now? We're not going to be long. We've had a lot go on this morning. You come right now. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way.
hope you'll take a moment to speak to the Tebas. There's a lot of stuff going on. Military guys, we want to appreciate you that missed last Sunday to the right as you go out the door. We've got cookies and punch and coffee down at a coffee shop that'll tie you over till you get your lunch. And uh, we just want to get to know you. And the concert tonight, Christian Stanfield, 7 o'clock. If you don't have your tickets yet, that's cool. We'll charge you double. No, not really. You come on. We've got room. We've got plenty of room, I think. And we'll have them at the door and all that good stuff. So God bless you. And, and remember, because Jesus shouted, Tetelestiae, it is finished. We're able to look and to follow the one who shouted the finish in victory and not in defeat. Keep looking up until he comes. This is 